Hello and welcome to a different edition of Mr C's History. We're going to be focusing on World Heritage Sites. Now, uh, London has four World Heritage Sites, Britain has 33, and there are over a thousand in the whole world. Uh, and so I've decided to have a little look at some of these World Heritage Sites, have a look at the whole, why are they protected, what's the point in them, etc, etc, etc. Very quickly, what is a World Heritage Site? Well, it's protected internationally by an organization called UNESCO, which is part of the United Nations. Their aim is to protect historical places, cultural places, etc. And the first one I'm going to start with is here in London, of course, is Greenwich. Over there, we're standing at the view that Canaletto painted and that Christopher Wren, the most favourite view in London, just over there by the river. We're going to look at the sites associated with the Greenwich World Heritage Site. We're going to look at Cutty Sark there behind me. Uh, and then and there's sort of the town of Greenwich, then with the Royal Naval College, College, you've got the Queen's House in the middle, and then at the top of the hill you've got the Royal Observatory. And we're also going to go behind that to the park, which is also part of the World Heritage Site, and there's some really interesting things there. So, let's get going! Well, I think the best way to approach Greenwich is through the Greenwich Foot Tunnel, opened in 1902. Uh, it had a bit of damage during World War II, but other than that, it's pretty much stayed the same. Uh, it's a really interesting thing. Well, why was it built? Well, it's interesting how many of the posh people lived in Greenwich. I think lots of people lived in Greenwich, but they worked in the Docklands and the other way, and they wanted to keep the river separate. And usually they had to rely on a very expensive and unreliable ferry service. So they build a foot tunnel. And here we are still going today. Interestingly, uh, you can cycle along here. You're supposed to dismount, but you, they don't. So you take your life in your hands a little bit. But it is actually part of the National Cycleway Number 1, which goes all the way from Inverness to Dover, it goes through here, the Greenwich Foot Tunnel. Well, when you emerge from the Greenwich Foot Tunnel, you're met with this amazing boat, the Cutty Sark, of course. A real symbol of maritime Greenwich. That's what this UNESCO World Heritage Site is called, the Naval Element. This is a tea clipper. Now, tea needed to travel fast because it would go off, so they needed to put it in boats that would travel very quickly. And this was built in 1869, and indeed it would travel fast. You could get to Australia in 77 days. However, it was built at a time when the Suez Canal was just been open, so the journey time was cut anyway, and at the time when steam engines were developing, steam could go faster than wind. So its days were numbered. But interesting, this stayed in service until the 1950s. Uh, extraordinary, sold to the Portuguese, etc., etc., etc. Now, interesting name, Katasak, and it actually refers to the lady on the figurehead there. She is Nelly, the ghost from Rabbi Baron's poem, Tamashanta. And it's the way he described the way she's dressed in the Kati Sark. Sark being the chemise, the dress that she's wearing. And Kati means rather too short. She is indeed scantily clad, so that's why she's called the Kati Sark. This is St. Alfie's Church, which if you watch the Mary video news where she her piano is, but this I want to talk about the person that's named after, St. Alphage, Alphage, whatever we want like to pronounce it. He was Archbishop of Canterbury in the 11th century, and he actually was killed by Vikings, Vikings who had landed here in Greenwich and used Greenwich as their base. They went off to Canterbury, stole him, held him hostage, ransom was refused to pay, and he was killed. Just another notch on the history of uh, Greenwich. Now we have the Vikings, all English history is here in Greenwich, and St. Alphage is part of the Viking history. This is the Royal Naval College. Uh, what well, originally was the site of the Palace of Placentia. Watch the Mary the First video for that one. But that went into disrepair around the uh, Civil War time. And then Christopher Wren in the late 1690s built these buildings. They were originally known as the Greenwich Hospital, and it was sort of a, a hospital and uh, an old people's home for old sailors, etc. And it carried on that until the mid, about mid um, 19th century, when it became the Naval College, the training base for the Royal Navy. And it had that role way up to 1998. So naval people would come, the sailors would come here to train. Uh, and now it's just a, a bit of a museum. There's a conservatoire there's, uh, where you can learn music, etc. The lovely painted ro room is in there, but it's sort of more ceremonial now.
This is the Queen's House, which was originally built for Queen Anne of Denmark, wife of James I. Uh, it took a while to build by Inigo Jones, the architect Inigo Jones. It wasn't really until Henrietta Maria, the wife of Charles I, who really enjoyed it. It may look sort of quite normal and something we might look, uh, we see quite a bit of in the UK now, but actually this was revolutionary when it was built. It was built in the classical Renaissance style, like Palladio, etc., etc., that had come from the continent. Britain had been building, you know, those Tudor red brick things or thatch roofs or something. What a difference this would have meant in the early 17th century. It wasn't around for long, though, as a royal residence. Civil War, Henrietta Maria, who was really hated by the Puritans, don't forget, because she was Catholic and she was French. Boo! So it, was, it wasn't, didn't last for long. And indeed, uh, during the Civil War, this was used as a biscuit factory, if you can believe it or not. Uh, now it's a lovely museum, though, so we'll, we'll just see if we can go inside. Another real architectural wonder in there well, this is the tulip staircase, which goes around the wall. Rather than stairs usually had the central column and you went around the column, like the monument in the, uh, for the Great Fire of London, this actually goes around the edge, revolutionary for the time. And they are beautiful, lovely blue um, uh, banister. Also, interestingly, there was a photo taken there in 1966 by a Canadian dentist, I think, which looks as if there's a ghost in it. Just Google Tulip Stairs Ghost and see what you can come up with. I don't believe it, but um, see what you think. Well, behind me is a building site, but also beyond the building site and the fence is the Royal Observatory. Now, I say they're doing a bit of work down and it's extremely busy with tourists over there. So actually it's a bit better if I explain a few things to you here. First, actually, to explain the statue. It's not really anything to do with um, astronomy or anything. That's James Wolfe, the victor of Quebec, the hero of the Seven Years' War, which some people, including me, would say was the First World War. But that is definitely something for another time. And he, uh, he essentially, the Seven Years' War, the reason why it was a world war, they fought in places like Indonesia. But specifically, they fought in North America and Canada. And James Wolfe was the man who beat the French at Quebec. He died at the Battle of a wonderful name, the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, which sounds biblical, but actually it was just a farm owned by a chap called Abraham. Anyway, he died at that battle, but he died in victory. And this is where his thanks say he gets a nice statue, which normally has a lovely view of London if you go beyond the building site uh, here, which is one of those protected views of London, which is what means that you have to be able to see St. Paul's Cathedral. There's another one in um, Richmond Park, etc. So James Wolfe has a lovely um, view. Uh, but behind him is the Royal Observatory. This was the original site of Greenwich Castle, a, a Norman uh, th sort of thing that loomed dark and brooding over the river here. It was knocked down by uh, Charles II, and he started his, he built the obs obs uh, observatory, one of the first observatories really in the world, rephrase that in the Western world, in Britain, the um, uh, uh, Muslim leaders in, in North Africa have been doing it for centuries, but that's a different point, isn't it? Anyway, uh, Ed, Edmund Halley worked here, um, checking the comet, etc., etc., etc. But of course, we associate Greenwich and the observatory with time and just behind me behind that tree there you might not be able to just see it is the uh royal observatory and there's a red ball at the top of it now what that means is is that that drops exactly at one o'clock because those people down at the river the sailors down at the river they would want to know when it exactly is one o'clock so they'd look up at the greenwich observatory and they would see right definitely one o'clock why because of course greenwich mean time this is the prime meridian the center of time Let's now go somewhere else to explain about meridians and time. Now, when you're sailing in a ship, navigation is very, very important because they're not, you're at the sea. There's not many features being able for you to locate yourself. You've pretty much just got the sun and the water and hopefully now a map. Now, one of the ways to deal with it is they divided the world up into longitude and latitude, sort of coordinates. Uh, and now a meridian is, a t is basically another word for a piece of longitude. Now, latitude is actually quite easy to figure out because the sun just moves. Uh, it, you can position yourself with the sun and knowing where you are in the world. Longitude is harder because the sun is always moving east. So it's difficult to know exactly where you are. 
So what they needed to do was time. They needed to figure out two things to solve the longitude problem. One of those things was you had to know exactly what the time was in a specific place. And the second one, you needed a really accurate clock that was okay on the ships. That's a different story. That's John Harrison's longitude uh, clock. What we're going to focus on is knowing the time in one specific place. Now, each country's boats then said, right, we need to know Britain's boats saying we need to know the time in London. And they placed it here in Greenwich because they were doing measurements here. This was going to be the British Meridian was going to be here. France had their own time based on the Paris Meridian and then Brazil would have had a Rio one or the, the Germans would have a Berlin one, whatever the case. But by the 19th century, it was getting quite difficult, really, with global trade because people were going at different times. Are you on the Paris Meridian or the London one? So a conference was arranged in 1884 by the US President Chester A. Arthur in Washington to decide what was going to be the prime meridian, the main meridian, the one where we need to know exactly the time in London will be this. And then over the rest of the world, we figured out from that. And they decided that indeed it was going to be Greenwich here was going to be the prime meridian, the main place where time was going to be measured. Now, the French got into a bit of a strop on this and they didn't recognize it until 1910, but they do now. So that's why all time is based here, starts here at the prime meridian. What's very interesting, and now that's why all the tourists are over there, you can go and stand on the meridian, stand one leg in the Eastern Hemisphere or one leg in the Western Hemisphere, and I've just gone and done that. Unfortunately, though, it's in the wrong place. Why? Because new technology has moved on, GPS and satellite, etc., since the 1880s, and actually it found the measurements were wrong. The real prime meridian is actually 100 metres to the east on a little path. Let's go and have a look at it now. It is this path here. This actually now is the true meridian. People don't know it, and all of those people, those tourists over there, the Royal Observatory straddling each line, they're still actually in the Western Hemisphere. It is me. Now, I am truly in both hemispheres right now. Well, we're in the park properly now, which is still part of the World Heritage Site well, nicely. It's been, they've protected all that, that part as well, which is excellent. And I, I think there's some real interesting secret stuff here, one of which is here. This is Queen Elizabeth's Oak, named after Princess Elizabeth, what we know as Elizabeth I, Elizabeth Tudor. She is said to, when she, of course, was growing up in the Palace of Placentia down uh, by the river, she was said to have come round here and played around this tree. Indeed, it also is meant to be said that Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn danced around this tree. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily, necessarily true. It was a, once a mighty oak tree, apparently. And it was used as a prison. I don't know how that would have quite worked. Do you think you would have just had a wooden door at it and you would, they'd hollowed it out and people would, if they got drunk in the park or whatever reason, they would be held up in here, which is rather interesting. And it died in the 19th century and it was propped up by ivy. It fell over in 1991 and they built this other oak tree here because, I, I mean, assumedly this will rot away at some point. But, well, I don't know if it's necessarily true, but it's rather interesting. Extraordinarily, there's even more interesting history here in Greenwich. These are long barrows, Anglo-Saxon barrows, essentially burial grounds. And there's a belief that actually these were originally Bronze Age stuff, BC kind of stuff. But these are probably more 6th to 8th century. You can just see a few bumpy bits. Now, a barrow is, as I say, is a burial ground. Now, this is pre-Christian, pagan, because when the Christians come, when Christianity in Britain, people are buried in a church, aren't they? In a nice grave, all looking very nice. Whereas... It, pagans, would, it would be built at the mounds on earth. And so there are some remnants here. That's quite interesting, the sort of 6th to 8th century there in Anglo-Saxon. The Christianity would be here, but it would have been tussling with many of these pagan beliefs. Bronze Age stuff, there would have been no Christianity whatsoever. But it's uh, just amazing Greenwich. Isn't it? We've had the Romans, we've had the Vikings, we've all sorts of things. Now we've got the Anglo-Saxons. And these burial grounds do have a lovely, lovely view of Canary Wharf in London, and the Royal Observatory here as well. So pretty great place to have a burial ground.
Now, the mound behind me may not look anything spectacular, but actually, we, most people believe it is actually a Roman temple. Uh, it was believed at first to be a Roman villa with some of the artifacts they found, but actually, they did more and more excavations in the 70s and again by Time Team in 1999 and found some pretty significant stuff there, statues and various different things, to suggest that this was indeed a temple, a Roman temple. Why was it here as well in Greenwich? Well, actually, Greenwich was on Watling Street, the street that went from Dover straight into London, you know, in those wonderfully straight lines. So actually, it would have been quite an important bit. And it would have also had a, maybe a view of the river. We've got obviously more trees now. Maybe there were more trees then, unless, I don't know. But uh, it would have been an interesting place for them to be within their journey. So here... We've got, we've had so far we've seen the Stuarts, we've seen the Tudors, we've seen the Vikings, we've seen the uh, World War Two. Even the Romans came here as well. Well, here in Greenwich Park is a bath, uh, actually, and it's it's part of it's called Queen Caroline's Bath. It's part of the old Montague Palace that sat here. The, the only thing that remains now are these walls, the outer walls, and this bath because this bath was actually in the conservatory a bathhouse annex onto it. Rather interesting. Now, who was Queen Caroline then, the person who this is named after? She was Caroline of Brunswick. She was the wife of Prince George, the son of George III, and they married in 1795. By the, in, all intents and purposes, they seemed to dislike each other greatly. Indeed, Prince George described her as unattractive and unhygienic, which is really specific, and that perhaps explains maybe the bath uh, there. Uh, they had a child, Queen uh, Princess Charlotte, but it, uh, it didn't last long for after a year they went their separate ways. Significantly, though, she refused to grant him the divorce, so they were still married, but he sent her packing over here to Greenwich, to Montague Pal uh, Palace, or Montague House, where apparently she lived a life of decadence. Now, this could be true, or it could be uh, fake propaganda put out by George to besmirch her name, whatever, but apparently it was a decadence, eat, drinking lots, eating lots, orgies, etc., etc., etc. But anyway, she lived here. Eventually, she moved off to Italy. But fast forward 20 years to 1820, and of course, George assumes the throne as George IV, his father, George III, dies. Now, as I said, Caroline never gave him a divorce, so she assumed and she demanded that she should become queen, queen consort of this new king. He was livid, extremely angry, tried all sorts of ways to, to stop her from the, uh, taking on the power, but she came over to England and actually she was extremely popular with the people because the king, the new king, George, was very unpopular with his, he was seen as decadent and pretty ineffectual, so she was seen as very popular. He refused her going to the coronation uh, so she was almost crowned Queen Consort without actually being there, which I don't know if it makes it official. But anyway, she died three weeks after the coronation. Maybe a bit convenient there for George. But good on her, old Caroline, for refusing to be dominated too much by the man uh, George the IV, uh, who by all intents and purposes, I'm not sure comes across greatly from this. But you can still see her bath here today, randomly in the middle here. Just next to Queen Caroline's bath is an extraordinary plaque to an extraordinary person called Ignatius Sancho, who also lived in Montague House. Ignatius Sancho was a slave. He was born on a slave ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and he started off uh, life in South America and Colombia. Age two, he was bought, as slaves were at the time, and brought here to Greenwich, where he worked for a family for, um, for, until he was 18. Then he ran away to here, to Montague house where they took him in and they they taught him how to read and write encouraged his love of literature his music etc 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 and became he became just a normal member of the household then he set up his own business he became a shopkeeper here in london and because he was a shopkeeper he was therefore eligible to vote and indeed he did he voted in the 1774 and the 1780 general election in britain and it I think many people probably would agree that he was the, he's the first person of African heritage to vote in a British election. What an amazing trailblazer he is. He was also very significant in the abolition movement. Please do watch my abolition video, the group that were part of it, because this was a key part of the time. And he became this amazing example of an extremely intelligent, extremely forthright, wealthy um, man who had come from slavery to show. And it really it went against the people that, those ignorant people who argued that, you know, uh, people from Africa are not the same as us and they can't be as intelligent as us. He ultimately proved them totally wrong. So an extraordinary man and he has a, a plaque here in Montague House. 
just outside the gates of Greenwich Park is a really interesting little memorial, kind of forgotten here on this rather long wall, but it is a memorial to the Cornish Rebellion of 1497. You might not think much about that, but actually it is quite significant. It was a rebellion against the reign of Henry VII, the Tudor uh, man who, who took over for the Tudor reign in the, the Battle of Bosworth and the father of Henry VIII, etc., etc. One of the first, he was waging war in Scotland, so he raised taxes. And one of the places that was most acutely affected was Cornwall, because Henry had also stopped the legal mining of tin there. So they were, their industry had gone and their taxes had gone up. So they were very, very angry, the Cornishmen. And so they marauded their way up through Somerset, Devon, etc., 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 to get here to the gates of his palace. And at the Battle of Deptford Bridge, they were brutally crushed. But, um, and there we go. But uh, there's another thing. Only a few months later, also in 1497, a man called Perkin Warbeck, who was a pretender to the throne, he claimed the throne because Henry VII's claim to the throne was a bit dodgy. And uh, of course, Perkin Warbeck claimed to be one of the boys in the tower, the murdered by Richard III, apparently, or so. But you know, that's a different video for a different time. He, Perkin Warbeck, tried to also raise the rebellion. He chose Cornwall as his place because he saw the Cornish were pretty revolting, pretty angry. But this time, Henry the Seventh had learned his lesson, and he met him, Perkin Warbeck, at you know, near Cornwall in Taunton, in fact, and crushed the rebellion there. So, this little plaque here is to a bit of a, and that really cemented the Tudor reign. Actually, all the pretenders to the throne had gone. Henry's consolidated his throne. So perhaps it started with this little lonely Cornish rebellion here. Well, I've now left the World Heritage site, the Greenwich Park with those walls there gone. And I'm now on Blackheath where I did the uh, Peasants Revolt video. And this is perhaps the best place to end. I, start, I entered the World Heritage site at the Greenwich Foot Tunnel, now at the top of the hill, the flat plains of Blackheath. I hope you enjoyed that. It was a good little look at uh, Greenwich, the World Heritage Site. What I like about it is actually one of the, it's the only World Heritage Site in London that is free to uh, explore and go around, which is really, really nice. The others you have to pay for and or you can see them from the outside. So maybe it's one of the, perhaps it's the best one. Let me know if you want to see more World Heritage Sites. Uh, and thank you very much for watching and don't forget to press subscribe. See you later.